let's look at some of the most serious, sometimes disturbing episodes of good old Cartoon Network. We'll try and focus on episodes that really push the envelope and stepped outside what is normally considered safe for kids' cartoons. Anyway, let's check out the top 10 darkest Cartoon Network episodes. Number 10. Samurai Jack, The Haunted House. And here we have our hero Jack entering a haunted house that holds a disturbing, long forgotten secret of death and suffering with only one sole survivor. And it's up to our buddy Jack to sort out this mess. Go Jack. The episode really builds Jack into that traditional haunted horror setting. There's this lingering, eerie silence as Jack's footsteps creak through the seemingly abandoned ramshackle house. And sure enough, the deeper Jack gets into this empty house, the more he's confronted by supernatural, frightening flashes of disembodied screeches. This episode masters the building of tension that is the crux of a good haunted horror movie, slowly building the tension in the silence till we're gritting our own teeth in anticipation of whatever horror awaits in the shadows. The flashbacks to whatever unmentionable cruelties and evil happened in this house are shown to us in this rough, black and white, minimalist Japanese art style, which really helps give that spectral, otherworldly ambience to the scene. It's both very creative, but gut-wrenching at the same time. But strangely, Jack stumbles upon a kindly family that offers him a seat to have some tea and relax for a bit. It's a trap! As Jack begins to let his guard down, this pleasant scene shifts and warps in front of us. And soon the family's expressions have changed to convulsions as foam spews from their gaping moors. It turns out that a demon has been haunting this family for generations and tricks unsuspecting passerbyers into the house. We even see Jack's soul get violently ripped out from his body by this malicious supernatural horror. Fortunately, our buddy Jack is a master of beating up demons, and soon is giving this rude guest host a well-deserved kicking. In the end, we see justice is restored as Jack reunites the trapped little girl with her family. But this episode managed to make me experience extreme tension, made my gut wrench, and left me slightly flustered. But as with most Samurai Jack episodes, it was a creative, compelling, and atmospheric experience. Steven Universe, change your mind. Uh, just a heads up, there will be some spoilers from the Steven Universe finale here, so feel free to skip to this timecode if you'd rather avoid those. What could possibly be dark about the epic finale to Steven Universe? Well, I'm putting it early on the list because for most of the episode, it's a gripping, touching, shocking, and spectacular finale to the series. But not particularly dark. However, there was one notorious scene that many people found very creepy. What have you done to them? They're shh. When the crystal gems arrive in White Diamond's chamber, there's this immediate shift in tone. My my, we've been causing quite a scene, haven't we? Suddenly, we're finally confronted with the empty, uncanny being that is White Diamond controlling her sister diamonds like empty, mindless puppets. Everything about White Diamond's appearance just feels wrong somehow. Her design feels sinister, freakish, and otherworldly, like all the life has been sucked out of the chamber. And her power is seemingly omnipotent as she extends her control to all of Steven's loved ones. And soon, Steven has to just watch as all three of his mothers become empty, lifeless puppets. Oh, thank you. How generous of you. Thank you, White Diamond. We feel so much better now. I feel excellent. Serving only to satisfy White Diamond's twisted ideology. This whole scene just makes my skin crawl. Steven begins to lose all hope as White Diamond picks him apart, exposing all of his flaws. Connie does manage to storm the lair and run to Steven's rescue, but is unable to protect him as White Diamond begins to perform, well, open surgery on Steven. 
But again, this one's early on the list, because that veil of horror is gradually stripped from White Diamond, as Steven eventually comes to better terms with who he is. <laughs> And in the end, he also helps White Diamond to come to terms with herself and accepting others. It was a dark moment that added to an overall beautiful finale for the series. Who, who is anyone? You know, if you just let everyone be whoever they are, maybe you could let yourself be whoever you are too. And for number eight, Powerpuff Girls, Twisted Sister, Tough Love, and Speed Demon. I'm clumping these three together as I personally consider these the darkest trifecta of Powerpuff episodes. As I previously mentioned in Darkest Kids Show episodes, Tough Love shows us the very unsettling idea of if our loved ones were all to suddenly turn on us and begin mercilessly attacking us. This alone remains among the most disturbing, brutal concepts I've ever seen in a kid's cartoon. But Blossom, Bubbles, and Buttercup still handle the situation with all the dignity, respect, and care that they can. Which, admittedly, when your family and friends are attempting to murder you, really can't be a whole lot. As for Speed Demon, we see the girls accidentally jump forward in time to a post-apocalyptic Townsville. A time where him, the show's equivalent to Satan, has turned the world into hell, since the girls weren't around to stop him for years. All their friends and family have either lost all hope, Stay back. Leave me alone. gone insane, or have just been killed in the reign of terror. Give away, he's mine! Don't come any closer! He's mine! They eventually jump back into the present, with a stronger determination than ever to never let that future come true. Which is actually a really unfair pressure to place on kindergarten kids. As for Twisted Sister, we see a side of this show that isn't just dark, but kind of distasteful too. In an understandable attempt to ease their workload, the girls attempt to make their own Powerpuff Girl. But instead of using sugar and spice, they use substitutes like artificial sweetener and dirt. Flowers, a cutlet, boxing gloves, ribbon, art, bandage, a smiley face, a glow, a knuckle sandwich. As a result, they make a young lady who appears to have a mental handicap. Yeah, we're sisters. Sisters! Struggling to talk and even walk. Personally, I really like Bunny. Although she was clumsy, she was very well-meaning and good-natured, and really wanted to help the girls. But from the slurring, exaggerated way she talks to her crooked, disturbing design, it feels a little bit like the creators were making light of the handicapped, and felt a little bit distasteful for my books anyway. And we finished the episode on the dark note of the girls watching their handicapped sister die. Overall, these three episodes are considered some of the bleakest in all of Powerpuff history. Number 7 The Amazing World of Gumball, The Rival I really enjoy bringing up the statistic of you're more likely to be killed by a friend or family member than a stranger, mainly because it forces us to realize how ridiculously low the chances of a stranger attacking us is, because we're forced to compare it to the likelihood of our loved ones attacking us. But in this episode of Gumball, it seems like the writers thought it would be a great idea to make that the main plot of the episode. In fact, this is about a character who, even as a newborn infant, wanted nothing more than to see her brothers die. <laughs> <laughs> Jeebus. We start the episode off with Nicole giving birth at the hospital, but then we find out the newborn is Anais, who for some reason looks like a grotesque monster. Anais quickly begins her reign of, uh, infant murder by throwing Darwin and Gumball out the window and into wet cement. She begins to slowly plan and plot out how to murder her brothers. She even pictures them buried in graves. Eventually she tries the uh, less than subtle tactic of sticking them in the middle of the street of oncoming traffic. Understandably, nearly dying doesn't go down too well with Gumball and Darwin. The episode shows us a few hints of outright psychopathic tendencies from Anais, such as ripping out the stuffing from her teddy bears, and more obvious signs such as uh, the attempted murder of her brothers. Eventually, after Gumball and Darwin fail to ship her off as dog meat, the two just decide eventually to just hug their sister and be glad she's okay. I guess they instead uh, killed her with kindness? Anais may be extremely intelligent, but more importantly, I often wonder how much actual empathy she has for others. 
We bear this. Tote life. Tote life. At first when I saw this, I thought, oh, what's the harm? They're just getting into the tote fad of being environmentally friendly. What's wrong with that? I mean, it does point out the unspoken social exclusion behavior that occurs from those who don't follow popular social habits. But then, things start to get really uncomfortable, as this social exclusion leads to a deep obsession. Three weeks later. Hello? An environmental protection service lady enters the bear's den, and what we see is a messed up ramshackle hoarding nightmare. Grizzly, panda, and ice bear have become disturbed, empty shells of their former selves, obsessed with tote bags in every aspect of their life. They clean with them, they eat them, they live amongst giant piles of them. Panda is even dating a tote bag. If you've ever known someone who hoards, these scenes can be genuinely upsetting. The cramped, isolated dark rooms, the endless piles of useless junk sitting there for years on end, it can be very unsettling for some people. Fortunately, Grizzly and Ice Bear are able to realize the insanity that is built up around them very quickly. Oh no, what have we done? How can we let this happen? Ice Bear is to blame. But unfortunately, as we see with Panda, not everyone always wants to change from these obsessive compulsive hoarding habits. The structure is collapsing! Soon, the house collapses under all the junk, and it rapidly begins to look like the bears are going to suffocate in their own self-created tomb. Okay, this needs to stop. I agree. Vacate these bears from the premise and incinerate these bags. <gasps> hey! Are you guys alright? Ice Bear's survivor. Hero. In the end, they manage to escape and put the bags to good use, but it's a cautionary tale of hoarders that some people will have seen in friends and family. Want some? Uh, no thanks. Steven Universe, Nightmare Hospital. <laughs> It should be pointed out that most hospitals don't operate as seen in this episode. All the parts of this episode, the music, the perspective shots, the lighting, it's all a setting straight from that of a potent horror movie. Otherworldly horrors roaring from the shadows. And these faceless, supernatural abominations moving with demonic speed towards our tiny adolescent heroes. Shrieks of agony and hatred echo through the desolate halls. When Connie and Steven visit the hospital, they see that some of Connie's mom's patients are Chimera Abomination Gems. Connie, I think that's one of the gem mutants. What? Are you sure? Pretty sure at this point. Fortunately, in the end, Steven and Connie's experience prepared them for these monsters. So the only key horror element missing from this scenario is our heroes weren't helpless. They may look helpless, but we know in reality, this is just another day on the job for this duo. And I suspect Stavani would have dealt with these monsters even quicker. Let's dance. And number four. Adventure time, come along with me. We see a lot of... Well, grotesque deformities and dying in this episode, as Bimo tells us about the most brutal war in post-apocalyptia, as well as when the world was going to end. Flee for your lives! If you fight, the demon will just add you to its mass! Like other Adventure Time episodes, we get our share of creepy, bizarre imagery here. In fact, we're just outright thrown into a psychological trip and nightmare between all the main heroes at one point. Seriously, everything has a set of eyeballs on it. Everything! The floors have eyes, the walls have eyes, hell, even the clouds have eyes on them. Didn't the animators' mothers ever tell them it was impolite to stare? As what is essentially the Candy Kingdom rapture continues, Golb, Adventure Time's equivalent to Satan, shows up to consume the entire universe. Then everything just begins to, well, either deform or die. Bubblegum just starts glitching in and out, Jake's puppies turn into flying demon spawns, and some characters just start melting. Oh. My. Golb! As Golb opens up his gaping maw, green plasma leaks out, 
surrounding all the candy citizens and armies. This bizarre substance forcefully merges them all together, turning everyone into these grotesque, chimera-like creatures, all with lumps, open wounds, veins, and general apparent coverage of the organic nervous system. Help me, Mom. I'm dirty, nasty. Somehow, in the end, we see that with the combined effort of everyone, Betty manages to replace Skull and become the harbinger of death and halt the rapture. The episode's a combination of both a brutal war, a weird chimera death demon apocalypse, the harbinger of death making everyone his playthings, and the rapture. Although this was an epic end to the Adventure Time series, it certainly had its share of well-earned, dark, creepy moments. Hey, no one gets to choose how it happens. The most important thing is that we're here together. Courage the Cowardly Dog, The Mask. Now I know what you're probably thinking, but Josh, every episode of Courage is Dark. Well, yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I personally thought this was the darkest Courage episode of all. Unlike some of the other Courage episodes, there's a creepy sense of reality to The Mask and to how its themes are discussed. He threatened my life. Oh my. The episode barely has a single comedic tone. Everything has a sense of brutality to it. In fact, a surprising amount of time is just dedicated to footage of Courage being severely beaten over the head by this masked woman. Pretty brutally, actually. Showing us Courage's flesh and brains hanging out. But despite all of this, Muriel never seems to notice Courage's desperate pleas for help. The story is, Courage, Muriel, and Hustis are visited by a strange masked woman who calls herself Kitty, with a spectral presence and a frightening mask. Kitty continually states, all dogs are evil, on account of her dear friend Bunny being in an abusive relationship with another dog. Dogs are evil. Oh. But as always, Courage helps save the day. Part of what makes this episode so dark, though, is some of the strong themes of domestic abuse. And although the episode handles the subject fairly well, it can be an understandably unpleasant subject for some viewers. Or maybe you're still thinking about Kitty. <laughs> I told you to forget her! So a severely beaten Courage hatches a plan to help out Bunny and save his owners. Man, this dog's a trooper. Seriously, what a resilient dog. Good boy, Courage. Good boy. Courage heads straight for where Bunny's abusive boyfriend Mad Dog is located. Move your tail, Bunny. For some people anyway, the scenes here can reflect images of genuine domestic abuse scenarios. Bunny tries to run, but hesitates whether to escape or not, conflicted by her feelings. But in the end, Courage is able to get Bunny out of there, and we get a nice image of Kitty and Bunny riding on the back of a train together. I was wrong, Bunny. Not all dogs are bad. While some of these situations can, unfortunately, cycle on until reaching a brutal conclusion, it's always nice to see someone coming out from this situation okay. It's a good Courage episode with a strong message, and overall, I like it. Justice League, only a dream. Superman, considered by many people to be the incorruptible hero. But in this episode, we're given the concept of our cherished superheroes being lulled to sleep, never to wake up again. Our heroes will have nightmares of their greatest fears where they can never wake up, forced to relive that horror again and again as the horror intensifies. A lot of nightmare scenarios of legitimate fears play out in this episode. Being buried alive? Faces melting off? Mind control? And outright exploding from the inside. Much like Batman the Animated Series, I consider Justice League to be a really powerful show. We get to see not just one, but many DC superheroes joining together to fight crime. But when you see them helplessly cycling through their worst nightmares, unable to wake up, it can be downright spine chilling. The main villain is John Dee, a simple average appearing human, but with something seriously off about him. We watch him stalk his ex-wife by showing up in the shadows of her house. When he eventually has her cornered, he reveals his new name is Dr. Destiny. That's a stupid name! See, I told you it was stupid! Why do I keep listening to you? 
I don't know. Okay, stupid name, but this guy still clearly means business. One by one, each member of the Justice League is picked off, being left permanently trapped within their own never-ending nightmares, constantly writhing in terror and agony. I mean, poor Hawk Girl is buried alive, desperately smashing from the inside of her sarcophagus. That's like one of the most terrifying eternal nightmares I could imagine. Fortunately, John is able to get through the Justice Team's minds to help them escape their own nightmares. And Batman manages to escape Dr. Destiny's mind control altogether by keeping his brain occupied with a very familiar tune. There's a brutal final fight between Batman and Dr. Destiny as he attacks Batman with a syringe, but he accidentally injects himself with some type of serum that leaves him permanently stuck in a catatonic state like so many of his victims. It's a dark, chilling Justice League episode. And before we get to number one, just a couple of quick honorable mentions. The Joy from Gumball. This episode was recommended a lot and it's played up as dark. But ultimately, the creep factor is more played for laughs. I mean, it's a hugging virus. Powerpuff Girls, Abracadabra, and Candy is Dandy. How many dark Powerpuff episodes are there? In Abracadabra, the girls face a reanimated magic corpse that forces Blossom into a spiked Iron Maiden. In Candy is Dandy, though, the darkness is more abstract. As we watch the girls slowly begin to cave to a growing addiction, Except, it's candy, but it's presented as though it's a drug addiction, which makes for a really good commentary that kids can relate to. Samurai Jack, The Birth of Evil. Here we see the show talk about when true evil is born, and the devastation it can have. I've always liked that about Haku. This character can jump between being an unspeakable evil and a comic relief in the next moment. It makes for one of the most memorable cartoon villains I've ever seen. Dexter's Lab, I I Eyes. Apparently, some people think of stalkers when they see this episode. But personally, even as a kid, I found this episode just kind of adorable. Steven Universe, Bismuth. Here we get introduced to the gem Bismuth. Her intentions are good in protecting her friends, liberating the Earth and fellow gems from Homeworld's tyranny, but she wants to achieve this by causing more death. And there's a fair hint of relish she seems to take in the idea of shattering the oppressors, and the satisfaction their annihilation will bring her. It's a trying tale of understanding our own hatred, angers, and wrath, and how these feelings can influence us, and whether we should choose to let them influence us. Anyway, on to number one. Haunted from Teen Titans. Heroes being tortured by their own minds as they lose all sense of reality, and we watch them slowly tear themselves apart from the inside. Relax. I promise, you won't feel a thing. Yep, this one is pretty dark. I'm fond of the saying that the greatest battle is within. We can be perfectly safe within our locked up home, but our thoughts can be keeping us awake or even giving us panic attacks, telling us we're in extreme danger when we're not. And that's just what we see here. Robin becoming insane and violent from a paranoid delusion. Despite Slade being gone, Robin still thinks he can see Slade, but none of the other Titans can. It's over, Robin. Slade's gone. It soon becomes abundantly clear to us that Slade is gone, and Robin is losing his mind. His friends try to find Slade, but only Robin can see him amidst his paranoid breakdown. Interestingly, as I watched Robin being continually beaten by Slade, I found myself questioning who was actually right. What was real? One moment it seemed like Robin was amidst paranoid delusions. The next moment I found myself asking, is Slade just invisible to everyone but Robin? Pity your friends are of no use to you. Why couldn't Starfire see you? I believe you are familiar with cloaking technology. And I think when a show can have us feeling that same uncertainty and paranoia that the characters are feeling, it's a sign of very good writing. But then, by the end, as all the Titans witness Robin fighting and shadow punching with himself, it's clear that Robin is completely losing his sanity, eventually threatening to turn on his own friends if they try and stop him. Soon, the Titans have strapped down their friend Robin and hooked him up to monitors. But even within the silence of the dark room, his own mind attacks him. At this point, Slade's omnipotent presence is skin crawling, as it appears Robin is never going to be safe. As long as I'm around, you are never alone. Seeing one of our long-term heroes completely broken down from the inside and strapped helplessly to a chair by his friends is a 
different type of disturbing. There's no enemy here for Robin's friends to help him fight, and the Titans can do nothing but watch helplessly as Robin begins to turn on them and himself. My friends are right. You aren't real. I'm real enough to finish you. Lights out, Slade. In the end, Robin does manage to come to terms with his mind's own delusions and tricks, but the episode still left many viewers very unsettled, and it also shows that even when their enemy is each other, the Teen Titans will do whatever they can to protect one another. Robin, you are never alone. And if Slade really does ever return, we'll be ready. We've got things covered here. Why don't you get some rest? Sounds like a good idea. But throughout the years, CN has brought us a ton of off-the-wall but relatable stories. And I think these darker stories are an important balance to the network's lighter stories. Because seeing the protagonists, we've watched for countless episodes going through these uncomfortable, legitimately disturbing scenarios can really give us a touch of realism to these characters. I personally find a lot more relatability in a character when we see them not just saving the day, but vulnerable or scared. And seeing them overcome some of these personal fears can be character building, and I think it has the power to inspire some people to overcome their own personal fears. And if you think I missed a particularly dark episode off CN, feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.